So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these slides, and I'm just going to throw out some information to you uh, about Title IX, some campus sexual assault information. Uh, I'm going to throw out some information as well about uh, reporting child abuse. That falls under uh, HR policy 222. It's one of our uh, reasonably new policies within probably what the last year and a half or so. Um, sexual assault also is a, an HR policy, HR policy 221, also a fairly, fairly new policy. So not a whole lot of lot of exciting stuff, but it's important stuff. So I'm just going to go ahead and roll on with it. Uh, sexual violence is a form of sexual harassment, therefore it is prohibited. Uh, for those of you who don't know, sexual harassment is a form of sex discrimination, so it is illegal, so that you know, just kind of all rolls into one. You will not tolerate uh, violence of any kind, and this includes domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, sexual harassment, and stalking. And these are all listed individually in those policies. So there's no guesswork involved as to, well, is this illegal or is this prohibited? They're all listed. Um, and they're listed not only in HR policy um, 221, but they're also listed in the student handbook. So we're covered both for faculty and staff as well as students. Um, if you're curious, it's on page 43. I did my research in the student handbook. If you don't have a student handbook, you can find the most recent copy. It's going to show up on the slides here in just a little while, but you know, if you've got your handheld devices and you're just really curious and you want to get out there and find it, um, you can go to the uh, CTC homepage, the student side of the homepage. I keep forgetting there's two sides now. Uh, and if you point to student up on the top, and then you go to st uh, current student, and then you click on learn more. And then you'll see listed there um, the student handbook. And they have it listed as Student Handbook of Texas. Do they have other student handbooks as well? They just want us to feel special. Okay. So yes, yeah, both policy and student handbooks. So we're covered on all bases there. Um, you need to understand that all reported violations within the jurisdiction of CTC um, will be investigated here at CTC. Um, it's going to be resolved through appropriate channels here at CTC. And again, this is all listed in the policies, um, so you can read it there. Uh, I'm not going to go through everything for you. Um, but we do have disciplinary processes in accordance with applicable laws. It's going to cover all the information. Uh, individuals who engage in such conduct will be subject to disciplinary action by the college as well as subject to penalty by state and federal laws as well, okay? So um, you get smacked twice, once by the college, you get smacked again by state and federal laws. Um, for victims of sexual assault, when we're talking about reporting, it's always encouraged that victims report being assaulted just as soon as possible. Um, I know that can be a difficult thing because uh, the victims of sexual harassment, it's, it's, it's such a, uh, a serious invasion uh, that sometimes it's, it's not easy to report. Uh, but we need to encourage folks. Um, and, and the more they understand that, that they can safely report being assaulted um, without becoming you know, the victims of ridicule and, and shame and all that kind of stuff, um, to report it just as soon as possible know that they can get to a safe place to do the reporting. But they need to be encouraged to, to go to the police as soon as possible. If they're not comfortable going to the police, they can go uh, to our director of student life, Maricelli Vargas. Okay. Any and all reports of sexual assault, dating violence, uh, domestic violence, or stalking need to be reported. And there's an actual uh, a list um, of who you can report to, depending on who you are, uh, whether you're a student victim, faculty victim, staff victim, so on and so forth, listed in Policy 221, HR Policy 221. Um, so if you haven't read those policies, get out there, be familiar with them. Okay? 
You don't need to memorize them. We're not going to test you on them, but you need to be familiar with those policies. In those policies, we have, uh, and I may be getting a little bit too deep in this, a little bit too far, but it's good information to know. Um, in those policies, specifically policy 221, we have uh, some definitions, and one of the definitions in policy 221 is uh, a responsible employee. And while we like to think all of our employees are responsible, a specific definition of a responsible employee is a supervisor, um, CTC official, what's the other one? Um, administrator, that's it, that's the one I can never remember. Uh, an official, an administrator, or a supervisor. Um, as faculty members, you are supervisors, your classroom supervisors. So if someone comes to you with a report of sexual assault, dating violence, domestic violence, or stalking, it is your duty, your responsibility to pass that information on to campus police. You cannot pass that duty on to someone else. We've seen what happened in the past when when certain individuals tried to do that, haven't we? Any place come to mind when I say that? Penn State? Okay, so don't, don't try and pass that duty on. We need to get that stuff reported, okay? Questions on that? It's your responsibility, right? All CDCD employees are obligated to report sexual misconducts of which they are become aware unless you have some sort of obligation not to. And there are some professions which you're obligated not to report that type of information. I can only think of a couple on campus. So most of us, we don't have that, that privilege to withhold the information. So if something is brought to your knowledge, make sure you report it. Students' allegations involving college employees may be reported to the director of HR and or campus police, whichever is closest and easiest for you to get to. Phone numbers are posted, they're easy to get to. Existing disciplinary and grievance procedures will be or will serve as the framework for resolving allegations of sexual misconduct. The policies are out there. Again, be familiar with them. Anybody know what policy covers your grievance procedures other than Holly? I know she knows what they are. This is one everybody should know. Policy 210. Okay, policy 210 is your grievance procedures. Um, students found guilty of sexual misconduct will be subject, subject to campus disciplinary penalties uh, found in the student handbook. Again, there's where you can find the student handbook. Real easy to find. Most, the most current version can always be found online. Naturally, college employees found guilty will be subject to discipline up to and including termination, as well as criminal charges off campus. Students found guilty of sexual misconduct may be suspended or expelled from college for the first, first offense. Employees and students may face criminal prosecution. I said that about four times already. I don't think I need to hammer that one home anymore. Unless you want me to. You want me to say it again? I can say it again. And again and again. The rights of both the accused and the complainant shall be protected and the confidentiality of the proceedings will be maintained to the fullest extent possible, naturally. We try and maintain confidentiality as much as we can. The rights of the individual filing the grievance to pursue legal remedies through criminal and civil courts will not be infringed by the use of college or disciplinary. Well, that's a long one. I hate reading the slides, but... So basically, if you have a case where there's sexual assault, you don't necessarily have to press charges um, to the police, but there's still going to be things that are going to happen through CTC. And that's just to make sure that because there are some individuals that don't want to have police involved right away, um, we always try to have them involved even if they decide they don't want to press charges, um, just so that we, if there's any kind of um, 
evidence that we might need later on. It's actually, a, you know, we have it in place. But um, the important thing to know is there's the criminal side and then there's the CTC side, whether you're faculty, staff, or student, that's gonna be the case. So just because you don't press charges on the criminal side, you know, somebody doesn't press charges on the criminal side, they don't wanna do anything, in, you know, that, that way, um, that does not mean that here in CTC we're not gonna address it. Well, there you go, okay? It's gonna be addressed one way or the other. There we go, every student, every person against whom a complaint is made is entitled to due process. We all know that, we're entitled to due process. CTC's investigations will include, include interviews with all relevant personnel, including the complainant, because, well, innocent until proven guilty, right? Um, so they're gonna, they're gonna get information from as many, as many people as possible, and what they're gonna be looking for is a preponderance of credible evidence. Easy enough. Then they're going to use that information to determine a correct or uh, an appropriate course of action. And if I'm not mistaken, they're going to look at like or similar cases that have happened in the past, and they'll use that to help determine what action to take for this or any like instances, correct? All right. Both the victim and the accused will be informed in writing of what's happened. They're gonna be notified of what the outcome was. They're gonna be notified of what CTC's appeal process is because they both have the right to appeal. And they're gonna be notified of any change to the results. When the results of the investigation or disciplinary proceedings become final, a student accused of violating the, C the college sexual misconduct policy could be criminally prosecuted in the state courts whether they're found guilty or not in the college proceedings. So just because we don't find them guilty doesn't mean that they get away with it. And I imagine the same thing would go for a fact or a, an employee, correct? Okay. We do offer domestic violence workshops twice a year through the student employee assistance uh, programs. That'd be Dr. Mahone Lewis's office. The police department offers specialized sexual assault education information programs for students and employees upon request. Just give them a call. I believe a good number for the police department is 1,200 or 12, 1,427. I always get them in risk management backwards, 1,427. There's also literature on date rape, uh, bystander intervention risk reduction and prevention available through the campus police department, the director of student life and activities, Maricely Vargas, um, as well as our student employee assistance programs. All right, <clears throat> for assistance regarding Title IX pregnancy, students can contact the Disability Support Services at extension 1195. I'll get to talk to Troy, right? Troy's, Troy's our expert. Oh, that's Wilma, Wilma Brown Smith's number? Okay. Um, but understand that it is the responsibility of the student to contact DSS and submit the required medical documentation. Y'all aren't going to reach out to the students and say, hey, y'all need to come in here and do this, right? It's the student's responsibility. If a student submits uh, the medical documentation to the Disability Support Services, the DSS office will directly contact the student's instructors. If you're not contacted, um, then this indicates that the student has not submitted the required paperwork. So at that point, it's not your responsibility to send them to the office, right? It's up to the student to do that. Um, they have to request any special needs, okay? Um, as a school, as a college, there are some things that we must do. We must allow the students to continue participating in classes and extracurricular activities even though they're pregnant. You can't, you can't dismiss them from activities just because they're pregnant. This means they can still participate in advanced placement in honors classes, clubs, sports, honor societies, uh, student leadership opportunities, and other activities such as school, uh, after school programs 
operated by the school. We must allow them to choose whether they want to participate in special instructional programs or classes for pregnant students. We can't force them to take those types of classes. They can participate if they want to, but we cannot pressure them to do so. Um, the alternative program must provide the same types of academic, extracurricular enrichment opportunities as the regular programs do. We must allow them to participate in classes and extracurricular activities even though they are pregnant and not require them to submit a doctor's note unless we require a doctor's note from all students who have physical or emotional conditions required treatment by a doctor. Okay? Pregnancy is not, not to be considered any different than any other physical condition. We must also not require a doctor's note from them unless they have been hospitalized for childbirth, unless, again, we require a doctor's note from uh, another student who has some other physical condition. Okay? Again, pregnancy is not to be considered any different than any other physical condition or medical condition a student may have. We, uh, we must provide them with reasonable adjustments, like allowing them to make frequent trips to the restroom when necessary because of their pregnancy. Uh, we must, uh, the student is responsible for requesting pregnancy-related accommodations through the school's disability office. We already said that part of it. Um, excused absences and medical leaves. We must excuse absences due to pregnancy. Okay. They must be excused um, for as long as the student's doctor says it's necessary. We must allow them to return to the same academic and extracurricular status as before their medical leave began, which should include giving them the opportunity to make up any work they missed. I asked, uh, since absences don't really count anymore, um, it really wouldn't matter unless they missed something like the final exam and then whether it was a broken arm or labor, if they didn't already take it up with us, because I'm sure we get students, like I get students all the time that say, hey, this came up and then I make the decision whether to allow them more time or not. But if, let's say we denied it and they brought it to you, then this is where this would come in, correct? Right, but that still doesn't have anything to do with us as far as, if they, I just want to use the story, like if they hadn't been in your office and built, and hadn't submitted any paperwork, and that's a temporary, temporary disability of broken arm anyway. So again, if it's way after the class time, they don't get an extension, the class ends on May 5th, the class is over. No, no, I was saying that it doesn't have anything to do with us. So as long as the work gets done, I had a, a student who was pregnant and she showed up maybe three times, but had she done the work, hey, you passed the class, and that's, I mean, because absences don't count anymore, right? So this is really not applicable unless it's applying to the work being completed. Once you get the documentation from us. But if you don't get any documentation from us, that's up to you. Okay. Okay. It all depends. You get documentation from us, then it starts. Okay, the absences and all that. But if you don't get any documentation from us, that's squarely on you guys, what you do. They do unless, like I said, unless you get documentation from us stating that there's a certain issue going on with the student. To what degree do the pregnancy laws relate to the father of the child? That's a good question. <laughs> I guess any other laws, the father probably has a right to kind of know what's going on with, well, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to research that and get back to you guys because I don't know the answer to that one right now, so I'm not going to give you any false information out here, okay? That's a good one, and I haven't, we haven't researched that, but I promise you I'll get back to you on that one. But okay. the question is, is the student, <laughs> the, the, the future student coming up will need extra time on exams. Right. So I normally leave the exams open, you know, for that period, and so if I, I want to make sure I don't get in trouble. So do I contact the student and say, you can take your exam, although everybody else has, like, say, for example, seven days for the final exam to take at any time during that period. I want you to take it on this date because I'm gonna shut the exam off for everybody else because they're getting extra time because I'm blackboarded. For example, I might have an hour and a half for exam and that's worldwide, okay? And so will I get in trouble if I say, you gotta take it on this date right here and you got the extended time all you want because I have to shut it so no one else can access the exam. 
No, because that's what they do when they come over in person. The, the instructors say, we want you to take it on this day at this time. Right, so I'm good if I say that. Then. Right. That's, that and the only way point. we can change that, that we change it in our office, if you guys change it. And say it's supposed to be at 8, and you guys say, okay, it's okay if they come in at 10 because some, they got something going on. That's the only time we change it. Okay. Because we have them right on the paper with Wilma what time they, they check in and what time they check out. I just want to make sure I wasn't punishing them or singling them out. No, you know? as long as they get their extended time, you're yeah. good. Okay. If you want to say, hey, I want you to take it on Wednesday, that's fine. Okay, that works. All right, thank you. We can't refuse to allow students to submit work after a deadline that was missed because of a pregnancy or childbirth. If a teacher's grading is based on uh, part in class participation or attendance, if a class is missed because of pregnancy or childbirth, the students should be allowed to make up that time when they come back. School may offer students alternative, alternatives to make up missed work, such as retaking a semester or allowing the students additional time in a program to continue the same pace and finish at a later date especially for longer periods of leave. If the student should be, or the student should be allowed to choose how they want to make up the work. They should be given that option. Students cannot be required to turn in work while on maternity leave until the doctor releases her. The missed work will have to be made up after the doctor authorizes her to return to school. If a student must miss class or part of a class to nurse or pump, the absence should be excused and the student should not be penalized for time away from class and given the opportunity to make up any work missed. I guess it sounds like all absences are excused anyway, so it doesn't really matter. So let me take the last few minutes I have here and go a little bit into reporting child abuse or neglect. And again, this falls under HR policy 222. You can find that online on the staff or faculty and staff side of the CTC website. A lot of information here. I just took the, the uh, a blurb from the policy itself. Uh, under Chapter 261 of the Texas Family Code, any person who has reason to believe that a child's physical or mental health or welfare has been adversely affected by abuse or neglect by another person must immediately report the abuse or neglect to the Department of Family Protective Services or local law enforcement. Our local law enforcement is the campus police. So that's a good place to report it to. This responsibility is applicable to all members of the CTCD community, whether uh, administrators, faculty, staff, students, or others. Everybody. Uh, just for definition purposes, a child in Texas is a person under the age of 18 who has not been married or had the disabilities of minorities removed. That's one of them legal terms that I don't even like to try and, and explain, but there are certain conditions um, that can be made, uh, certain things that can happen that will remove them from the classification of being a minor uh, before they reach the age of 18. Uh, failure to report child abuse or neglect is a class A misdemeanor punishable up to one year in prison or jail, or a fine up to $4,000. So it's, it's a, you know, not a game, something that should be taken very seriously. Um, now we're going to have a lot more minors running around on campus. Uh, we need to keep our eyes and ears open. Where to report? Well, Department of Family Protective Services, there's a toll-free number. Um, keep that handy. Local law enforcement, campus police, um, numbers are up there. Required information, I'm not sure how you'll get all this if you're not up close and personal with, with the youngins, uh, but this is the information they like to have, the name and address of the child, name and address of the responsible individuals who care for the, the child, uh, and any other pertinent information that you may have. The law provides immunity from uh, any resulting civil or criminal liability for people who report child abuse or neglect. Uh, again, that's for anyone who makes these reports in good faith. Um, and we do offer training. I don't personally have training uh, on this specific category. I do offer uh, an online child abuse awareness training that was designed um, and licensed by the state of Texas. I offer it for our camp counselors. But I did find uh, some training online from the Department of Family Protective Services. Um, 
There's the link. Um, you can access it from my employee training webpage. Uh, real good training. It's about an hour long if you go out and, and follow all the links and watch all the videos that goes along with it uh, on reporting child abuse and neglect. I would recommend it that everybody get out there and, and go through that training. Uh, it issues a certificate from the Department of Family Protective Services when you're done. Just good information, good training, good to know kind of stuff, okay? This is what the website looks like. Nothing complicated, but real good information. Lots of good stuff. Um, I am Charlotte Wesley, and I am the advising and success coordinator. So we have a different set of students that we are trying to reach. I deal primarily with the first time in college students. So with that being said, it is now time for the FAST program to get underway for yet another semester. Okay, I do have handouts um, available for those that want them after um, I get through speaking. Um, as I said, it's time for the FAST program to get started. Um, we want to emphasize that there are only three mandatory visits for our first time in college students that you, the faculty, have to, um, to do. And those three sessions are the initial session where you are introducing yourselves to the students, the midterm session where you are checking with the students to see how their semester has gotten on the way, where they stand, um, and then the final session where you're discussing what has happened throughout the semester, um, what they could have done better, what you could have done better, um, just how the semester actually ended. So there are only three visits that um, we are emphasizing that you must do with these students. Now, just a little bit of background on the FAST program. Um, the implementation timeline, of course, in fall of 14, um, the FAST, there was a small-scale test pilot for the system set up and the creation of the faculty training. Then in spring of 2015, the FAST program went out with a large-scale test pilot, finalizing the system setup and the faculty training. In the April and May timeframe of 2015, the FAST did a soft launch and implementation of the actual faculty training. In August of 2015 was the official launch of the FAST program. In the fall of 2015, the full-scale implementation beginning on the CTC Central Campus. In fall of 2016, the implementation of the FAST program begins again for all CTC campuses, which brings us to this semester, um, the fall of 2017. Um, so far, again, beginning with the spring of 2015, the pilot program, we had 67 advisees assigned, a total of 67 advisees, and 75% of those were contacted. In the fall of 2015, we had 488 advisees assigned, 802 contacts, with a total of 366 visits. In the spring of 2016, a total of 201 advisees were assigned with 300 contacts and a total of 177 actual visits. For the fall of 2016, 271 advisees were assigned, 271 outreach attempts with a total of 74 visits. So for the spring, of 2017, the SSP, the Student Success and Persistence, we begin the semester with the initial session. 130 outreach attempts and 41 initial visits for a total of 100% participation on advisor track. Thank you.
for the midterm session where we turn the contacts back to the faculty. We handed it back over to you. The initial for the spring of 2017, um, Mariana and I did those contacts. So we handed it over, handed it back to the faculty for the midterm. We had 40 outreach attempts with 20 visits. The final session, we had 129 advisees assigned, 29 outreach attempts, and five total visits. Five total visits, okay? So now that it's time to start for this fall, I'm very optimistic um, and I'm hopeful that we can be motivated to get this going. We will not be doing the initials um, visits this starting out for the fall. So again, we've pushed it back to you, okay? I know you guys can do this. I know you can, and I know that, one moment, and I know that you want the students to succeed, and that's what we're here for. These first time in college students, that initial visit, hey, hi, I'm Charlotte Wesley, I'm gonna be your faculty advisor. This is what uh, we have going forward. I see that you're a business student. Are there any concerns for you for the semester? Okay, these are your goals, or do you have any goals that you've set for yourself? And then for the midterm session, you follow up with that student to see if they've met or they're following their goals. Again, if they have any questions or concerns, if they need any referrals to any of our um, services that we provide. And then with the final, to see what worked, what did not work, where they fell short, where you fell short. And just to summarize that, okay? Um, from what I'm understanding, this may be the last um, year, the last semester where with the FAST program. Um, so this was a um, program that we were trying to get going. So we just need to finish strong. What we have done, um, and I'm sorry, I didn't forget your hand that you had raised. What we've done so far um, was to simplify. We've tried to simplify the advisor track process, um, shorten the forms, the forms that are available in advisor track. Um, the emailed, we've emailed the advisees list to the faculty individually. Um, we've offered eight training sessions, and this is over the, over the course of the FAST program. This is what we've done. Um, the advisee list is available in the advisor track. We've sent reminders of when the advising sessions are due so that you don't have to wonder, when is the midterm session due? When is the final due? We'll send the emails out to let you know. One-on-one um, -on -one training for those faculty that need it, all you have to do is let us know that you need this training. Um, we've also emailed the students to let them know who their assigned advisors are. And we've added a message feature on advisor track for communication and tracking purposes. Okay, um, so what I also wanna let you know is that we ran the list of advisees. Mariana ran the list. So the last report showed that we have only 187 advisees so far for the fall semester. We will run the report again at the end of the week, um, at the end of the week, to see if that number changes. Hopefully we'll get more. Um, the official list of advisees will go out on the 28th to the department chairs and the faculty. At that time, that's when you'll find out who your advisees are. Um, we have the advisor track refresher training starting on tomorrow, and we'll have that it's gonna be available for three, three different times, at nine o'clock, 11 o'clock, and three. Okay, so there's no need to sign up. We'll have the training across the way um, in the academic studio. I'm Madeline Spear. I'm an incoming sophomore, and I, that's it. <laughs> My name is Desiree Allman, and I'm a junior now here at Early College High School. Hi, I'm Ayanna Zachary, and I'm a junior now going into Early College High School. And I just want to say, guys, I'm pretty nervous talking about <laughs> you guys, so just bear with me. 
How are you going to feel when some of the students are very blunt about some of these issues? Are, is it going to intimidate you? Um, honestly, I don't think it's going to intimidate me. I was raised, um, my mom's not a soft person at all. So <laughs> she, she's very blunt with us. Even at a young age, she always taught us, you know, um, everything's not going to come easy. You're going to have to work for it. You know, you're going to hear stuff that you don't want to hear, but you know, it's life and you just got to take it. I'm a pretty mature person for my age. So that's excellent. I feel like with the topics that you said we'll talk about, some students may, you know, they may have like, you know, feel some type of way about it. But I think it's all something that we're all going to have to deal with because through life, we're going to hear stuff that we don't want to hear. We're going to have to work with people that we may not want to work with. But then again, it's something that we're going to have to deal with. That's an excellent answer. By the way, we always have a, a safe word in sociology so that if you feel extremely uncomfortable, you can say it. It's usually a kiwi or banana or something. Um, I feel like at early college, they really embody a sense of family and a sense of um, truth. So I, f I feel like not only could we make these honest statements, but we can appreciate that others have different opinions from us. They teach us tolerance. And personally, coming from a mixed racial household, I've had a lot of different kinds of slurs and stuff like that. And I think that just this kind of school environment has really helped prepare us for that. Like Madeline said, we have a big family feel. So I feel like if a student is a little bit uncomfortable, they may either go to one of their other students, their peers, or and together they'll go and say that, hey, we're not comfortable with this. But also because of social media, I feel like a lot of us are already exposed to a lot of <laughs> slurs. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah. Or probably more than I want to know, so. Um, I would say that it's fine because I have my own opinion on stuff too. Good. So I can't judge somebody over their opinion. Perfect. Everybody's opinion is always welcome in my class, even if you disagree with me. Yes. Okay, I really did miss it because I'm, I love sports, and I felt like when we went to the other building, we didn't really have that. Of course, when we went to lunch, they gave us time afterwards to go play in the gym. But I felt like we should have had more, especially since, you know, some people, they kind of get out of their shell when they're doing sports. Mm -hmm. So I felt like we should have had more of that. So, of course, I did miss it, and I did miss you. So I know. I know. Uh, I'm just having y'all. <laughs> Um, well, I feel like that's the main focus of early college high school. It's bridging the gap between high school and college. So obviously they didn't immediately drop us into 10-page papers and things like that. But, I mean, we do start out with a lot of writing. We have a lot more expected of us. At first it's kind of a shocking like experience, like, whoa, we have a lot more put on us. But I feel like it's enough that it's like slowly dropping us into an environment that is competitive, that is um, very... Uh, Long, like it, it requires you to put in a lot of effort. And we also are take classes, um, required classes, all four years is AVID. I mean, some of you might be familiar with that. They offer it at all the other high schools, but all of our students here at early college take AVID. And it is very focused on time management. And then in the later years as well, it also like t helps, you to, helps you to apply to colleges and things like that. So basically, it is kind of a college prep class. We also take a class called PATH, and it really does help bridge the gap between high school and college in that it is um, very informative and teaches us, like, we, we have to pass the TSI to get our college credits, and that kind of helps us get through that. So I think that early college really prepares us for that. Okay, one thing that we really had to learn to do was manage our time. In class, we had to learn to be proactive and put first things first. Like, when we get home, don't go outside and hang with our friends. We need to do our homework because it'll be due the next day. So if a student comes to your class and says that they don't know what time management is, then that's wrong because one thing that we really had to learn to do was manage our time at early college high school. Hi, I'm Satchel Bellart. Uh, I'm a junior. So, um, One of the reasons that we're all still here is because we learned how to manage our time. Because they've been really hard on us since ninth grade. 
they've been trying to get us ready for this moment for us to go over here. So all of us were already really well versed in managing our time. We're ready to tackle all of your classes. So yeah, I'm super excited. Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> One more thing. Um, I think a really good um, aspect about our school is they don't sugarcoat anything. So we were already told, like, hey, if you don't pass your English class, you're not going here again. Like, you're out of this school. So we already have that mindset of taking everything seriously. And it's not a joke, because we are having this wonderful opportunity. And we don't have to pay two years of college, which is really expensive. <laughs> So I think that's a really important aspect. And because we have so much people, it, like it's not just us, but we also have 100 and 200 of us together. We could all go together. And we tend to go to Barnes and Noble and just do our homework together. And just those little study sessions are very helpful in managing our time. Um, from a f sophomore perspective, last year I was a freshman, obviously. But um, so I feel like we have a pretty great deal of homework, definitely more than the other high schools. Um, like I said, it's not like they're immediately like in a college environment, but we do definitely get a lot more writing assignments, a lot more um, in depth as well. So it's not even just more paperwork, it's more um, like provocative learning and things like that. We're adults, we like to sit around and speculate about what you think. Um, the, the big question is, when do you feel like a college student, when do you feel like a high school student? I felt like in ninth grade when we had gym, that's when I felt like a college student because we weren't treated any differently than the real college students. Like we were expected, you know, we had to be on class on time. If we missed a certain amount of classes, we would be dropped from the class. Like that's where a lot of responsibility came in. Oh, so I feel like what she was saying, um, our gym class was a little different. It wasn't with like actual college students. I mean, I guess we kind of are, but it was with other freshmen. But um, it's still like the entire environment felt higher stakes. It felt like we had something to lose. And so I think that instilled a lot of responsibility on us in itself. And so I feel like just knowing that um, your education is your responsibility just makes you feel inherently more like a college student. Um, I think another thing is, especially during the college classes, like for me, I had theater arts last year, and the maturity level of the assignments that we got, like they they had aspects of nudity and different, more mature information into the different assignments. And if I feel like when the workload is put at and I don't know how to explain this. OK, <laughs> basically, when, um, whenever the teachers treated us like adults, we felt like, a, like college students. But mm. there have been times where we have been babied. Like, <laughs> but um, it really depends on how we're treated by the teacher. So the college um, professors definitely made us feel more like um, college students, whereas the high school teachers, we felt a little more like high school students because of how we were treated. Um, so I feel like because at our school, if we, oh, I feel like at our school, if we have like a certain GPA, like if our GPA is too low, we get kicked out. So we are already taking it as a, like, I can get kicked out of this program. So that kind of keeps you feeling like you're a college student. And like she was saying, like you have something to lose because we don't get a second chance. Like once we're sent back to our home campus, we're done. All right, so um, I want to be a corporate lawyer, and that's going to be a lot of school. And even though I already made JV Heights football and all of that stuff, I was like, man, I kind of want to get further in life than I think football and sports and stuff like that can take me. And I could do like TBI or other things, but I like the culture and the climate that Ms. Burke like what talked about when she came to Union Grove and talked to me as an eighth grader. So I just decided to go into early college because I thought it was the best thing for my future.
Um, for me, I'm Korean, so education is very important to us. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I actually found out about early college before it was like we, there, our school found out about it because my brother went to Ellis and he's like, Tess, there's this, well, sorry, I, Barbara, I guess. <laughs> um, he, um, he told me how they, um, they had this program for high school students who could get their associate's degree and education was so important to me. And I already knew I, want, I wanted to go into college and I knew that it was really expensive. So even before like everyone came to our school, I was asking my teacher, I was like, hey, when are, when are we gonna get the applications? Like, when can I apply? And I think it was like a no brainer to me because I just really wanted to get more challenged in from like academics rather than the other high schools, which aren't very, which aren't bad at all. But I knew that they were gonna be more rigorous. So I was more excited to come to early college as a student than going to a regular high school. Um, I personally was on track to go be in the varsity orchestra. And so um, all of my friends were pretty much in orchestra, so they all wanted to go in. So I kind of talked myself out of it, not only because of that, because everyone was like, you can just take dual credit at your high school, at your home campus. And I was like, oh, okay. And so I talked myself out of it, but then I had a discussion with my parents and my, um, and they really, and I really sat down and told me, and, ma and we really talked about it. Basically, it's different because we are getting an associate's degree. It's not like, oh, I have a college credit here, I have a college credit there. They may not accept it where I'm going to school. This is a physical diploma that we will be achieving. And that was just really important to me that we could get ahead in this. And also the boost in, um, or the not having to pay for the two years is just extremely, like I'm just so grateful to be given this opportunity. So when Ms. Burke first came to my, my middle school, I went to Palo Alto, and she was talking about early college. I was like, you know, it sounds so good, and it, you know, what, what can go wrong? And then, <laughs> yeah. And like, one thing, one thing that I had a hard time doing was, you know, accepting the fact that I would have to leave my friends, the friends that I've been with all through middle school. And so finally, I was like, I wanna be an orthodontist when I grow up. This will give me a two year boost. Like, I'll be ahead of everybody. I'm ahead of my brother right now. He's older than me. So <laughs> I had to make the decision to, you know, accept my offer into early college high school, and I'm not really good at making decisions, but I can honestly say that this is one of the best decisions that I've made because it put me on the right path. Okay, so when Ms. Bright came to our school, I was really just, I was listening to her, but then I was just kind of brushing her off. I'm not gonna lie, I'm sorry, Ms. Burke. But um, then, I just kind of started thinking about it, and I was just like, Ayana, you know, you're probably not even going to have these friends that you have now, you know, in the future. So then I applied, and then I went to quit. And when I wanted to quit, my mom, she was honestly the one that really just pushed me. And I'm glad I stayed because it really just showed me the potential that I had that I didn't know I had. So, um, so I wanted to go because... Like I wasn't, I wasn't even there for y'all's speech at our school, but um, I wanted to go because my mom didn't get her high school diploma. She had to get her GED, and I so like that kind of showed me that like anything could happen, and like you shouldn't like take your, oh I'm definitely gonna get my diploma and go to college because you never know like when your stopping point is. So I applied to the program so that I like I knew I could at least power through these four years and have my associates and diploma. Hi, my name is Kathleen and I have the pleasure of being principal of the Early College High School. So on behalf of all of us and especially these guys, guys, we are the first of the kind. All of us in this room are going to help these students become the very first in Central Texas to do this and we're on the right path. Most early college high schools screen the SPED kids out at the beginning. We have SPED kids. We have 504 kids. We have homeless students, all right? But what we have, guys, 30 to 50% of early college high schools send kids back. Out of all of our incoming juniors, we are down to just one junior who has not got through that TSI reading and writing, the reading. And that's a testament to everything that has happened between the two campuses. But most importantly, now we always talk about that we baby them, but you know what, we don't baby them, we love them. 
and we help them and we want them to become the person that they are because if you had met some of these guys two years ago, PE can probably attest to that, to see how much they have changed. So even though we're not on this campus, over there we are instilling what CTC wants us to do. And you know what? This is our first time doing this. So we're learning also. I mean, I hate to say y'all are the guinea pigs, but you're kind of the guinea pigs. So we just please continue to communicate with us. And just remember, hold them to the same expectations that you hold for all your students. But in the back of your mind, they are 15. We only have seven drivers. Oh, I'm sorry, she's 16 now. 15, 16, OK. And you know, all those things that are running through your mind as a parent, we are very vocal and honest with our parents. And there are things that are going to come up, and they're going to come up. And we're going to have to deal with them from our end and with Ms. Vargas. And so we are already being proactive instead of reactive. So we just want to say thank you. We are so excited because there's 211 coming this year. And the next year, there'll be 300. And the year after that, there'll be, God willing, 350. So I just want to say thank you. And I'm super duper proud of you. So love you guys. Hold on.